He's Isaac. He's Philip. We're unfiltered. We're back. <laughs> Josh, what up, bro? Hey, how's it going? Thanks for uh, thanks for having me on. Or should I say, what up, cuz? Because like technically, we're cousin in laws. Would be cousin in laws. Because yes. our wives are cousins. Yep. Which makes us cousin in laws. Mm-hmm. So I can't say, bro. What up, bro? Anymore. Can't say that. Can say what up, cuz? What up, cuz? <laughs> All right. That's it from now on. Thanks for coming down, man. Thanks for visiting. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having us. It's uh, it's always a good time to come down here and and uh, and get away a little bit from South Dakota. Right. Absolutely. And our, I mean, our shared experience was uh, the fourteener. Yeah. It was right. Colorado a lot harder than I ever thought it was going to be climbing the fourteener? Yeah. 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 When you get to the top and you just take ten steps and you got to stop and you just repeat until you get to the top. Pretty wild. <laughs> yeah. Pretty how, wild. How long did you just like do nothing once you got up there? I laid down and just uh, a good move for a while. And then <laughs> there's there's like the locals. This lady was probably in her fifties, and she had a she had a climbing stick, but she just she passed us, went up, <laughs> took a few pictures, went all the way down, and just up and down. So she's done it a few times. Good for her. Just quick, just a normal Saturday afternoon. Yep. For her, must have been. Do you remember that one girl we saw run in? She yes. was like running for time up this 14. Yes. I'm pretty sure we, she was p- passing us on the way down before we even yes. got to the top. I right. Mean, yeah. Well, wasn't it, she was quick. Wasn't one of you guys saying well, we rented those uh, you know, side by sides and the owner said on his 40th birthday, he went up and down to 14 or three times in a day. Yes. Then, three different 14ers in three. a day too. That's what he said, wow. which I didn't. Which ours, our 14 was six and a half miles, if I remember correctly, which took. What was the total time up and down was like six and a half hours or yeah, so. Yeah. It was yeah, like an hour, a mile or something like that. Yeah. So it's his that he did. There's no way he did three six and a half milers unless he just booked it up and down. He had to have a couple hours shorter or like started higher, you know. Right. But yeah, that dude just out there in the middle of this place renting side by side. Middle of nowhere. In the middle of nowhere. UTVs. Yeah, yeah. And he's just like, oh, yeah, I remember doing that. <laughs> Telling a story like. Who are you? Like, we're, you should be like out hiking these high altitude mountains or something. Yeah. If you're, well. Because if you want extreme climates, you go to Colorado. You go to Colorado, which in the world of climbing, I guess a 14er is like, it's like hard, but it's not supposed to be impossible. Like, yeah. It, the average Joe who doesn't exercise, like, yeah, you're going to struggle. But if you work out, you've got some cardiovascular endurance, like, theoretically, you're supposed to get up. Right. Some of them, but then others are like crazy hard that yes. require mountain experience. Yeah. And the biggest thing is the, the oxygen, you know, you have less oxygen, so you kind of get a, a headache, if you will. Mm. And that's what I had. But Isn't it like 12,000 feet? Is that when it starts to like get really difficult or maybe? I don't, know. I don't remember. It was, all, it was all difficult. Actually, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm thinking of is on Netflix, I watched this one day when I was home by myself, which is rare, but uh, it was called 14 Peaks. And it was this guy. This guy's name is Nims Perda. And he climbed all 14 mountains that are higher than 12,000 feet. 12,000 meters, feet, meters. Must got to be feet. That's where I look to you and say, look it up. up. Maybe I'll (laughs) look it up myself. But then it's like over, gosh, over X amount of feet. It's like that's when you no longer can survive. I think it's 8,000. Without like oxygen assistance. Yes. Yeah. Correct. For like, for like a long time? Period? For a long time. It's oh, like okay. within 48 hours. If you don't like get oxygen within 48 hours, you're like in trouble. Yeah. And so he, he used oxygen to climb these 14 peaks and then he did it in under seven months. It was like six months and six days. And he's the first person to do that since there's this really legendary mountaineer. And he did them all over the course of like 16 years that he did it without oxygen. Mm. But it's like no one's ever done it faster than that. So it's like the record to climb all 14 of these is 16 years. And then here this guy comes and does it in seven months. Seven months. Wow. And like crazy stories. Like fascinating documentary, which, yeah, wild. It's interesting when you go to that, that climb. And I've always heard like athletes go to places like that and train and then come to lower elevation. Because like when we came back, like we like to do CrossFit and we noticed your endurance breathing was better it was it was yeah for mm. but not for 
that long. It was like three, four days, and then it kind of came back to normal. Fascinating. Yeah. Huh. I've heard that set of like soccer teams, like clubs that play like on the national level, they say the high altitude teams like just can go longer because they've got that breathing endurance from being at high altitude. Mm -hmm. I wonder what the recovery for that guy was like. I mean, do you think that's a major part of the space between, you know, one peak to another peak is taking time to like let your body recover? What do you think the process is like? Or is it like an oxygenation thing? I, I don't know. I mean, I'm out of my depth. Deep. Deep. I don't know. There's apparently there's this one test that they do at a super exercise physiology, like a deep lab. And you have to, you get on a bike and it restricts your oxygen flow. And you have to last three minutes is the test. And most people don't make it in three minutes. And while you're doing that, you're playing like this cognitive game. So you're just pedaling and you're trying to like do this thing. And then you get tested on how well your cognition maintains over the three minutes if you can survive that long. Mm -hmm. And like this Nims Perta Nims Perta guy, his he's like the best score that they've ever seen. Because really? he lasted the full three minutes and he was still like cognitively fine. Wow. Mm -hmm. So it's I don't know. It in the death zone, it's okay, so here it is. The death zone refers to altitudes above a certain point where the pressure of oxygen is insufficient to sustain human life for an extended time span. So if you're up there with no oxygen, you're just toast. Wow. Or you get stuck, which is why Everest is dangerous because it's like super tall and then you right. get stuck at the top and then you're without oxygen or if your oxygen fails, or you get caught in the cold or the... I don't want to do that. I don't want to do Everest. No desire. No. No? No desire. Do you? Uh, I can't really say I've thought much about it. Is Lindsay? Uh, heights are not my thing. No? So I'll, hiking, also not my thing. <laughs> So those two go together and right. then automatic, no thank you. I feel like I like the idea of like tackling a challenge that big, but yeah, it's probably not going to happen. I can't really visualize myself doing that ever. So I mean, you're in the cold. It's going to be a no. Like that 14er, it was at least, you know, you got to put a sweatshirt on top. That was about it. Right. But yeah. like there you're in full on yeah. winter suit. Right. Blizzard. Mm -hmm. It's like imminent. Yeah. You're going to be in one mm -hmm. wild did kind of strike me though like probably like once we got down that really big you know uh peak there's like that what is it the dwight eisenhower tunnel that you go through mm -hmm. and then you go down like this super steep incline and then there's like a town at the bottom of that and i noticed like as soon as we were in the mountain like through that peak all the stores had oxygen for sale in them oh really yeah like all the walmarts like even gas stations they had like these little tubes with like a mouth breathing thing huh. on them so yeah. i didn't i didn't realize that that would have been nice <laughs> that would have been nice <laughs> hack a couple of those and yeah, yeah. for next time right recover yes, my time. goodness <laughs> us iowa boys we need a little help up there yeah, we don't know what we're getting into <laughs> pretty 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 flat in these here woods yeah yeah well then on the way down and you're working you're working a different muscle on the way up on your legs and then on the way down you're working on trying not to fall down uh. with like these front muscles and then yeah and then loose rocks, so it's a different, whole different thing. I mean, you go, you pretty much at a constant speed, but you're just trying not to fall over. It's hard. <laughs> yeah. Is that something you would be like, oh, yeah, everyone needs to try at least once in their lifetime? Yeah. It was a good experience. It's hard, you know, but bring water, take your time, and it's a really cool, super awesome view. That was, mm -hmm. It was fun. I would do it again. So hopefully we take Katie again on something like that. For sure. I think she'd love that. Your wife. Do you think going with people is uh, important when you do something like that? I mean, do you think that enhanced the experience for you? I think so. I mean, we had uh, my other, <clears throat> my two brother-in-laws with us, and one just took off, and he was at the top of, and waited for like an hour for the rest of us to get there. <laughs> and the rest of us kind of had groups. And, yeah, I think it's it was fun to go in a group. Yeah. yeah. That's legit. Fourteeners. Yeah, you'll have to travel for that. Can't do well, it here. No, none in, none in Iowa. We'll just say that. None in Iowa. Breckenridge. Colorado. That's would that. yes. Would recommend. Would recommend a your honeymoon spot, which was legit. It was. And then my thirtieth birthday, Breckenridge. Mm -hmm. That fourteener. Boom. Go there. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Breckenridge. Colorado is like the place. You know. 
Like you've got to, you've got to get there to experience Colorado, like Colorado. There's no other state quite like Colorado, even though like Utah and there's some mountainous areas, but it's like Colorado is just different, isn't it? Right. Yes. Well, Josh, you hail from South Dakota. Mm Mm-hmm. How old are you? I am 26. How did you grow a beard that good? 26 years. Mm. Um, I started kind of in eighth grade. I had a beard since eighth grade. Have you really? I have, yeah. Um, but I haven't grown much since then, so that's probably an early boomer. And, and yeah, my my dad had pretty much the same beard. It would be mm-hmm. you know he used to go up to his you know full on full on huge beard. So probably yep. got it from him. When was the last time you shaved fully? Mm. I've been with been with Katie for six years total. They were dating and marriage, and I think I've been clean shaven once. Time period. Beard's here to stay. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Right on. So you, we were talking a little bit pre-podcast too, and you're a district's, district sales manager. I am. Yep. And For a seed company. So mm-hmm. I manage, you know, you use direct sale of two, but you have dealerships under you that you manage in a territory um, trying to sell and promote your brand of seed. So corn, soybeans, and alfalfa is what we, what we push. You're about to be busy, about to ramp up. Well, yeah, we're kind of the sales season's mostly done. Now it's more of delivering seed to their dealerships, <clears throat> and then from there they will send, you know, deliver to farmers. And, and then planting season starts. That's our busy season for us. And then the rest of the year's service, you know, checking checking the crops, being in contact with the customers, and then growing the seed. I mean, your sales season starts technically in July, and mm-hmm. your I mean your sales don't have until like December. Sure. Those farmers are trying to prepay for tax reasons, and, sure. and that's when their best discounts are. So, right, that's when you're, that's when you're, you're busiest um, in terms of sales. So. Is early, like late summer or middle of the season. Uh, well, that's when you develop, start developing Is relationships. Mm-hmm. Yep, and growing. You know, maybe if you sold to some guy last year, you want to keep growing that relationship and servicing them so they grow in their mm-hmm. sales mm-hmm. in December. January time frame. Where do you get seed from? Um, so it's all our headquarters out of Scandinavia, Wisconsin. Um, and then it's shipped. That's a warehouse there. And it, it ships out to our dealerships or direct to customers from there. So how many, how many farms would like one representative, um, you know, have a relationship with or do it, the sale work for? It varies. Does it? Yeah. I mean, some have, 20, 40 customers, some have start, some are starting out small and they have maybe five. And then, you know, like in, you have retailers, it's like say co-ops that sell. And you also have farmer dealers who sell, but also plant it on their own farm. Um, they can kind of, they get, get some discounts on seed and, sure. and also make money from selling to neighbors and whatnot too. So, I see. Mm-hmm. so is, is it pretty standard that like, common that like a co-op would sell to local farmers and then like you guys would sell to a co-op is that a, is that a typical practice yeah a lot of the times i mean like co-ops a lot of co-ops have several different brands mm. and then they'll sell direct to the to the customers Let's see. the farmers so then i would work more directly with the salesman at the co-op mm. yep interesting so take us take us all the way back to the origin of the seed like the warehouse in wisconsin mm-hmm. and where's it where was it before it got to the warehouse in Wisconsin? So, like, I'll start with corn, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, corn is, you can't you can't take something out in the field and go and reproduce it. It's a hybrid. So when they create a field corn, there's a whole process. And a lot of this has happened for us in the middle of Minnesota, like uh, Olivia, Cato area. And what they do is they have female lines of, of corn, and they, they plant them about seven or eight rows, and then they plant a male row right between in this kind of protected field. And then when the plants grow, they start, you know, they pop out tassels. Then what they do is they, on the females, they go in and they detassel all okay. the female tassels. They pull them off. They either have these, it kind of looks like a, those old school lawnmowers, you know, that you push and it's like blades, or they have these wheels that just pull them off. Hmm. 
Um, and but they leave, then they leave the male for now, <clears throat> male row, and then you let that pollinate the female rows. And then once that's done, they'll go in and just run over the male row, and then because they don't want any more cross pollination or anything like that. So then the female then creates an ear, which is a lot smaller than what you'll find in a field. It's only going to be, I'll say, a field average, maybe 200 bushel. Here, it's more like 60 to 80. What's a bushel? How big is a bushel? Um, 56 pounds. 56 pounds? Yeah. So like standard. a, like, I mean, it's a bigger bushel, than bushel a bushel basket. You ever seen those? Like the old school bushel baskets. Mm, this Steel. is where I. This is where I look to you and say, <laughs> so look it up. Look bushel it up. basket, and then flash that on the screen. <laughs> once. Yeah. So then from there, um, it doesn't get. Not a typical combine goes through there. It's um, it, they take the whole ear off, and it goes to a, um, basically a finishing facility. From there, it'll be dehusked. So it'll go through these big husking beds. So you take the husk off the ear of corn, you know, like you've seen sweet corn, you dehusk it, mm-hmm. takes it off, goes into a dryer. And I think it gets pulled out at like 35%, and they got to dry it down. And then from there, it goes to a sheller. And then from there, it goes into the sorting, where and this is a really cool part. It'll sort by seed size. So there's like the bottom of the ear is going to be more of the bigger kernels and then towards the tops the smaller ones so and, and farmers pref- have preferences so from there it goes into these basically these big sieves that sort based on seed size mm. and then there's another machine that it drops kind of vertical and it puffs uh, a puff of air if say a kernel's cracked or if it's purple or anything like that gets rid of all that stuff so you will have a really nice product and from there, it gets treated and bagged, and that's, and then they, and they, that goes to our warehouse. So we pay, every company does this, we pay those people's companies to do that, bag it for us, because, I mean, we just, we have enough stuff going on. So then from there, it goes to our warehouse, gets sorted based on sales, and then shipped out. How do you, okay, so here's a bushel, first of all. Mm-hmm. That's like, so 56 pounds goes in that thing. But you yes. don't like use those anymore no, no. no it's, it's all just based all on weight. weight so a bushel is that and it used to weigh 56 pounds and now you just put 56 pounds in a bag and you call it a bushel well in a bag there's 80,000 kernels oh, okay. per bag okay of corn of corn um but a lot of guys bigger guys use these big pro boxes so there's either 40 to 50 units in those pro boxes they're they're big plastic pro boxes i don't know if you can pull that up but a pro box that's what they're called yep You've probably seen them. They, you can flip them over, but they have a big lid on them, and yeah, there you can put a fork under, pile fork under them. Is that what gets to you? Is that what you deliver to a? <laughs> that is the finished product. That's the that finished product. The, the farmer. Okay. Yeah. yeah, or in the bags, you know. Eighty thousand kernels. We'll go into a bag. Ah. Then take eighty thousand times forty to fifty units, depending on seed size, that fits in that big box. Oh wow. Yeah. So when I looked up Pro Box, it was a weird vehicle oh. <laughs> i want to see the weird vehicle okay it's, it's funny because like those boxes i mean it's pro, you know depending on what, what type of seed you have in there genetics it's like ten thousand dollars or so in mm. each box so it's wow yeah, i gotta be careful with them but so don't <laughs> spill it basically don't spill it because yeah. if you spill it it's over it's like unusable i mean you could yeah you could but use you it. can't return it or ah. it's broken seal there's a pro box for you. A That's box. a Toyota. A Toyota pro box. <laughs> we like Toyota, yeah, well, don't we? Boy. That looks like a I don't know if you I like 80s lot, or 90s. You fit a lot of seed in there. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. I wonder if it. You're not filling these vehicles, Josh. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. Okay, so you said something way back. You said a the male row pollinates the female row. How mm-hmm. do you how do you pollinate? How does it pollinate? So, have you ever seen a corn plant on top? There'll be a tassel which kind of looks like little fingers, and then there'll be pollen that comes off of that. And then down below, like halfway through the height of the corn, there's where the ear is, but on top is the silks. There'll be like little string-looking things. And each silk is a, basically a pollen tube. The tube the pollen will, will uh, travel into that ear. So each silk is one ear, or one, sorry, one kernel. Okay. And that, that's how it's pollination. Fascinating. Is. Yep. Well. Wow. So if you have like a drought during silking time, it can shrivel up those silks, and then you're going to have poor pollination, or that ear's not going to fill up on the 
top mm. or there's a good bugs feeding, you know, stuff like that. So. How much of this did you know? Because you've, you've done a little farm work. Oh, this is way beyond Way beyond. Me. Yeah. <laughs> but what's funny, I mean, the, uh, sorry, the, uh, um, the detasseling and all that, it's very, they're very strict with it. So they have the machines that go through there, but they also have crews that come in. Because you're going to have some tassels that are just short, mm-hmm. and you're not going to get them with the machine. They're going right. to pop up, but you have to get them all. So a lot of my friends did detasseling in the summer. It's not fun. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Sunburns. <laughs> yes. So what you're talking about is like you're you're creating and building seed, but then like you also have to detassel the crop, like what a farmer puts in the field. Is that different or is that the same type of detasseling? <clears throat> um so what the finished product what's in the field is not the male or female, it's a hybrid. The hybrid. So the male and female will create a hybrid, that yes. specific hybrid. That will create, that's what goes into a typical field that you see. That grows tall, yeah. can yield, you know, whatever, average of 200 or something like that. You don't have to detassel that stuff. No, you don't. No. Ever. Ever in the history of corn, you've never had to detassel that stuff. Uh, no, I mean, not that I'm aware of. It's mainly for the seed production that you do so the So if someone's detasseling, you're detasseling a, a field that is going to seed production. Yeah, so if you've yeah. seen... Oh man! See cornfields that look like the tops are just chopped off and they're you know way shorter than normal. That's probably a production field. Oh, interesting. Yep. I don't think I've ever known the difference right there. <laughs> yeah, we go on uh, production tours every year, and it's it's pretty cool. It's pretty eye opening, and that explains a lot of the cost of seed because it's it's a process for sure. Sounds like a process. Yeah, and then like soybeans is it's a similar di- type deal. But we can you don't have to do that sort of thing with pollination. It's just you. Know, a lot of times you hire out farmers to do it where they block off a whole field to the specific variety. They keep it separate in their bins that we take it, we clean it, process it, bag it. Similar deal, but it's it's a different process than it is with corn. So You've got to have thoughts. <laughs> or are you thoughtless right now? No, I mean, I think it's interesting. What I think is cool about that process is like you're preparing – two years in advance, what's going to go on the ground like this year, right? Because, I mean, you're or at least one year in advance because you've got that growing season and then it has to all get processed and then it would get sold yes. and then it would go on the ground and then grow. And then on a management side, like our production managers have to, with our help, we forecast, you know, what hybrids we're thinking we want to sell. Mm-hmm. And then that's what they need to know for, for production acres. You know, they need to know how much of this we're going to produce – and then sell. So it's yeah, it's at least a two year two year process. Yeah, with corn. So if you really wanted to like mess America up, <laughs> it's like go for the crop producers. Like go mess up those fields. Yeah. Or, or I mean, like if a tornado goes through, does that really just like decimate an operation or something like that? Yeah, like you're talking about like the production acres. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. But you have different. I mean, it's spread out. They they sure. have that kind of planned out. They a lot of it. You know, for us, a lot of it is in the middle of Minnesota, but it also stems all the way down to Nebraska. That's where that company does stuff. So, so you don't put all your eggs in one basket. Right. I know, like some of the big, some of the big companies took a hit when that derecho went through. Yes, mm-hmm. a lot of those acres got kind of ate up. But so not just the farmer, but the production company too. They took right. a hit. Yeah. Wow. Right on. What uh. It's just a question that popped into my mind. What percent do you think of farm ground goes to crop production, like that kind of seed production, rather than overall crop? I mean, is that a number that gets talked about in your industry? Not a lot. Not so it's much. pretty low. Is it pretty we low? You don't, compared to the, the actual acres of just corn production or yeah. you know, normal production. I don't know the number, but sure. it's not, not a huge number. You don't need thousands and thousands of acres, yeah. you know, because one ear is going to create how many kernels. Right. You know. So is it is it like are you guys in demand for like farmers to take part in the product seed production process? I mean, are you usually looking for more to do that, or is that a, like a need that's pretty much satisfied for soybeans? Yeah, we, you're you're growing that, so yeah, you're actively looking for more people on the mm. on the corn side. No, because there's specific companies that do it. So like we <clears throat> we pay certain companies, and then that's what all they do. Sure to do that for us to create our hybrids gotcha. so cool. yeah it's a little more a little more out of our control with who they have on the corn side who the, who the farmers are, are doing it for them so i see but like we're uh we're also an alfalfa breeder so we we have our <clears throat> we have our production 
all out in Idaho where a lot of alfalfa is produced and then we'll, we'll breed it there, create seed production and bring it back. So, so I, that is new to me that Idaho grows other crops and potatoes. Yeah. <laughs> that's good to know. Yeah. Alfalfa too. So that's yeah, a, that's right. where a lot of alfalfa is grown is in Idaho. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Very cool. Are we, okay. You're a humble guy. This is what I know about you is you're a humble guy, but you've obviously just like flexed. You're an expert in the agronomy, <laughs> farming, crop production area of expertise here. Okay. Are we, so here's my question for you as an expert. Are we farming out the nutrients of our soil? Like, are we in danger of ruining farmland? I think we've made really good strides to improve on that. And we're heading towards the right direction. There's a lot of people that, yes, that's absolutely happening but there's a lot more people that are doing it the right way now. Mm. <clears throat> and they're, they're trying different things like biologicals. Like for example, there's this product, I won't name it, but it's, um, it's a biological that fixes nitrogen in corn. They say what, like 40 units it can produce. Well, that's 40 units less of synthetic fertilizers that you got to put out there. So that's where the industry is heading is to reduce Synthetic fertilizers and more of that kind of stuff. Because synthetic fertilizers are theoretically harming. It's, I mean, it's just not as good as more of the natural stuff sure. like that down the road. I mean, it works and it creates good good production, but it's not, I don't think it's a sustainable um, route in my opinion. Right on. Yeah. What, what about like cover crop? It's, uh, the government pays you a lot to do it. Or, okay. You know, to, to do it, but... It's a lot of work for a lot of people. Mm. That's why I think a lot of people don't do it. But there are a lot of benefits. I know a guy personally who's been doing it for for years, and he does these dig tours where he brings people out, and he'll dig down into the the profile of the field, and you'll see the structure of the soil, and then you'll go to a and you know a field that's just you know tilled every year, and it's, there's a vast difference. Mm. Also, there's difference in earthworms, which is a huge part of of production mm. um, and they notice that that increases a lot biologicals in the soil that are being killed by say whatever else you know so cover crops are coming it's just it's uh it, it's more work and a time con- time constraint for a lot of people mm. earthworms like essential yes for nutrient dense soil breaks down nutrients breaks down the organic matter um if you there's actually a video out there I need to find it again, but it's a heat vision camera at night, and you actually see these earthworms pop out and grab oh, uh, fascinating. a leaf of corn and pull it off. Oh, wow. So, I mean, they're, they're, they're pretty cool. That is cool. Earthworms. Mm-hmm. So think twice before you step on one the next war. Right. <laughs> or like if you're fixing to go fishing, head out to the cornfield. Head corn out field. to the cornfield, do some digging. <laughs> right on. There's, there's, I mean, there's out some there. giant ones out there. It'd be wow. perfect. Crazy. Yeah. That'd be almost creepy to see, I think. I was just, I'm, I'm not ready for that. Right. Yeah. Well, like, and there's other guys that are doing more things. Like, I got a guy I work with who's a, he's an organic farmer. He farms a couple thousand acres. But what he does is he, uh, he cultivates. He has, like, four cultivators, and then he has a flamethrower. <laughs> so when the corn's about, I don't know, half a foot, half a foot to a foot, He'll go out there with that and just fry everything. He said the corn looks brown, fries the corn, and then within a few days it turns green again. But that's how he gets the weeds in the middle, you know, in the row. You can cultivate between the, the rows, but there's always weeds that pop up that you can't can get with the cultivator. Oh, man. So he goes in there with that. It's like a typical sprayer, if you've seen one, with a big old propane tank on it or whatever gas he's using. And then it's got these flamethrowers between the rows and – you can adjust that, but just goes through and looks like like a big row of fire going through the field. So <laughs> that'd be kind of fun to see too that at night, cool. especially. Yeah, right. Yeah, but that, is that just something he rigged up himself, or is it... he rigged that up? Yeah. <laughs> so like John Deere hasn't come and bought that yet. Not yet. No. But okay, man. Yeah. That honestly it's, sounds like something you would do. That's an innovator right <laughs> yeah. there, man. Yes. Yeah. Pioneers. Right. Yeah. So he was telling me about the income of it, and he, like he was like, "Oh yeah, I mean." He's was making like seven hundred bucks an acre, you know, which is pretty high. Pretty high. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot more work. You got more fuel, et cetera, time versus spraying it once in the in the in the summer. You 
you got to cultivate it and, and do that, but that's pretty good income. Opportunity sure. cost is high for that then. Yeah. 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 You know, I, I'm just parroting information that I heard from someone else, but um, Justin Robbins, a former unfiltered guest, he oh, yeah. just won. I don't know if you saw this. He won the re our like third region of the United States um, environmental stewardship award. It was at like this big conference and got this award and he talked about the practices on their farm and how they do cover crop and they do pasturing over fields and they mm -hmm. like clean up their waterways and he, i'm more than what i just said but they have all of this work that he does and it's interesting that you talk about you know it's just more work to do that because that's basically what i heard justin say in yeah. his speech was like well we just do the things that make sense to do and you know mm -hmm. it is a lot more work for us but we want to do it the right way so yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of people out there that do that. And there's, but there's other mm -hmm. people that just farm thousands of acres and just want to be in and out. Really, you know, there's there's broad spectrum, but I think overall, the awareness of all that it's coming. Sure, you know, there's it's going to take time to develop things like that biological stuff. Like that's yeah. a natural bacteria which is doing that work. It's going to take time to get to a point where we can rely on that. Mm. You know, it's not going to be over a day. It's probably going to be 10, 15 years. Who knows, but farming is changing fast. So, so would you say like in the next 20 years, there's going to be major changes in the farming practices that you see as common? I think so. Like it's not just going to be your plow or cultivate in the fall and plant, pull it out, do it again. Like there's going to be more steps. There'll be more steps. I, mean, I think there'll still be that, but yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be changing. Like the, it changes faster than a person thinks. Like I know a guy who, He's, he's probably in his 90s, but he's like, I started out farming with a horse and a boogie, you know, like X bottom plow. And now he was in this half a million dollar combine driving it. And he's like, in my lifetime, I've seen the biggest change in, in farming or technology, you know, horses That's to a $500,000 wild, huge machine. Wow. So, pretty cool. I mean, what's next after a combine? You know, like what, <sighs> what's going to help you get it done faster except a, a bigger one? Self driving combines. Sure. I mean, that's. That's, That's probably where it's going. Thing. Yeah. But do you think, are we at a point where like the convenience factor is like almost maxed out and now we have to like go the other way and look at how to like get the more difficult jobs to do done on a mass scale? I, I, yeah, I see what you're saying there. I, I think so. I mean, I don't know how big everything can get. Yeah. That's, that's my, I asked that question too. It's like, how do you guys get much bigger than this? I don't know if it will. Just it's going to be more efficient in one way or another. We need more flame throwing yeah. sprayers. <laughs> there you go. That's a, that's part of the answer. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, there's other things that are going to come into play, like the EPA restricting a certain chemical anyway for for whatever reason, like bees dying. You know, there's there's a whole bunch of things that are going to come into play too that we just don't know about. What do you? What about what is the thing with bees in? Lindsay, hold your tongue because I know you got a big old thing about. I love bees. She's got a thing for bees. Okay. She admires a, the bees. I what have a bee tattoo? Because like, if you erased bees from the world, I've heard that's like mega bad. Like pollination issues. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's from broad spectrum insecticides being used, moving around, drifting. If you actually pull up, I looked at in South Dakota. If you actually pull up the, there's a list of bees um, nests or whatever you want to call them, farms. Mm -hmm. It's like a solid block hmm. of the whole state so in south dakota that is in south dakota it's a lot of bee production there yeah, yeah. fascinating I mean, i'm sure there isn't you know most states you know there's like little white what do they call those bee towers yeah. all they're all around hmm. you know but you gotta be careful what you spray around those because they can move and drift and kill them so wow yeah and without pollination then there is no like your flowers you know they're not going to pollinate okay or not pollinate as well or whatever or like your male and female corn to right. see. <laughs> yeah. Except for that's more self pollinating sure. cross pollination. But yeah, it's yeah. there's plenty of plants out I mean, there that need need the bees. I was watching, you guys ever seen Top Gear? Yeah. Uh what's his name? Uh Jeremy Clarkson. Jeremy Clarkson. He does this t this T V show. I think it's on Amazon or like Clarkson Clarkson's farm. farm. Hilarious. Oh my gosh, it's so good. The guy <laughs> has no experience in farming, only has done cars for how long? Yeah. He goes and buys a farm and just has no clue. And he's like, cost how much to do that? You know, and just, it's an awesome, it's hilarious because he, he has a guy, few people that teach him how to farm and he's struggles with it for a long time. But uh, he was saying one time, he's like, when I was a kid, 
you drive down the road and your your car's full of uh, bugs. And I was like, there's none. And this is over in the UK. So, and then they were just talking about that sort of a topic. Hmm. Fascinating. That's like one of Isaac's favorite TV shows. Yeah, it is actually. <laughs> it's so it's so funny. It's hilarious. I love yeah. that. And like Caleb is like this nineteen year old kid, and he just like tells Jeremy all the business. It's it's hilarious. Yeah, he, he buys a naturally. So it's in a it's in the UK where the fields are not huge, so the the equipment's smaller. He goes and buys this big Lamborghini tractor and doesn't know how to drive it. Doesn't know how to get it to move because there's buttons everywhere. Oh boy, you know it's funny. I would suggest watching it. It's, it's good. Funny. It's I've been recommended enough now that I think I have to. I haven't yet. <laughs> I'll watch it with you if you want. Boom. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> start. We'll start it after. Yeah, this. we'll watch guess, it again. Guess we know what we're doing after this. Yeah. Well, it makes me think too, and this is you know, I mean, since you brought up Clarkson's Farm, I feel like I can bring up another program, which was the B movie by. You know, Jerry Seinfeld voiced that. Yep. Did you, did you ever see that? The B movie? Can't say I have. Oh, well, I watched no. it with your child one of the times. <laughs> I, I mean, it's like sense. an animated kid movie. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But it, it touches that issue because at the end, like, they kill all the bees or they take them all away or whatever. Right. And then, or no, 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 no. They, like, go, they, it's, I'm going to spoil the whole movie here, but they win a, <laughs> they win a court case where they get all their honey and man can't take their honey from them anymore. So they're like, oh, we don't have to work anymore. So they stop pollinating and then everything dies. And then they're like, please come back, bees. And then they do. And then it's a happy ending. But. Oh, my. It's funny how they introduce that stuff to them, into movies. Yeah, no yeah. kidding. <laughs> this mega subtle issue. Subtle message. <laughs> mega issue. Real subtle. Very subtle, yeah. <laughs> Man. So did you always want to like go this route with your career? And like Colin, did you always feel like called to the agronomy and crop yeah. production? Yeah, I think so. I mean, that's kind of what I want to do, something agriculture related. Uh, we farmed when we were younger. Um, we got out of it. And then, uh, you know, I've been, I've been in it my whole life. And then went to SDSU for agronomy, um, got me an agronomy degree. And then I was an agronomist for a while at a <clears throat> CHS location. You're familiar with that big company um, and worked there. And then I got into the seed alone business. And I've liked it quite a bit. You know, the agronomist is a great job. It, you learn a ton, um, but it's very, very demanding of your time. You know, you're working 100 hours a week in wow. the spring. Crazy. And, yeah. and you're, yeah, it's it's demanding, um, but I definitely will never regret it. You learn a lot. That leads you to your next positions. But now it's nice just be strictly seed. So that's that's nice. What you were, you were, taking us through a story, uh, a drive there. Was that something you learned in school or something you learned from like the, the job, the agronomy job or both? What drive? Or, what? or just everything you said about seed and seed production. Is that like what they teach you in college or? Um, in college, no, you teach, they teach you more of the science part of it. Okay. I mean, it's deep into like chemistry, the science of soil, mm. plant life, you know, how does ATP work in a plant and, and that kind of stuff. And then they have you do internships, and that's where you learn a lot of the agronomy side. But they don't they don't teach a lot of the everyday agronomy stuff. They teach you the, the base, the background, the mm. backbone of it. Um, and then, yeah, real fast you learn pretty fast in agronomy. You know the sales part of it. Right on. Yeah, fascinating. Hundred hours. That's it's a lot. It's a lot. You, the worst part was you wake up before your kids. Uh, wake up and then you get home when they're in bed. Mm. That got tough, you know. But you're providing for them, and that's that's the main thing. So for sure, does that balance out in other times of the year? Like, are there slower seasons or slower, but not it's like key. It's key there. But it's not like you know there are other seasons where you're only doing like 30 hours a week. It's like in the winter, like February March, we would do the four day. It was still 40 hours. Yeah, but we'd do like seven to five, and then take Friday off. Mm. You know. A little, which is really, really nice. But like, you know, in the in the summer, you're spraying, you're scouting, you're still it's still busy. Yeah. Um, in the fall, then it gets busy again, but it's not that many hours. It's probably more like six to seven, something sure. like that. So that that's nice. It was nicer. Yeah. yeah. It was seasonal. At least it wasn't. It wasn't all year. It wasn't three sixty five hundred right. hours a week. Right. Yeah, that would be a lot. But it, the I mean, you work with a lot of people. That was mm-hmm. fun. I mean, I had. During, during the summer, I would check my phone. I mean, it would be 
every every I would do it on average every like five minutes would be a phone call you know wow. from someone like a farmer and you're within you know how like on the iPhone you have X amount of phone calls recents mm-hmm. it'd be full by like noon and then it would start over wild <laughs> wow. yeah. That's the way it is now, or that's the way it was during the agronomy job. That's in the agronomy job. Okay. Yeah, because you have you sell the farmers who want your fertilizer, they want your field spray with their pre-emerge, they want their seed, and yeah, it's just it adds up. So it's awesome. Yeah. It was, so, I mean, it was fun. It was yeah. Just tiring. Sure. Yeah. So making a shift like then from the agronomy to the district sales manager position, I mean, was a major motivator for that, like conserving your time. And trying to like have, I don't know, more of a consistent. I don't know if your schedule is a lot more consistent now. It sounds like it is. Was that a primary motivator? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was what I wanted to do long term. But now I work from home. Mm. Um, you drive a lot more. You still got to be um, pretty disciplined with your time, for sure. But it's a lot more flexible. Like if you got to watch your kids at three thirty one afternoon, not a problem. You don't have to go and ask somebody. It's, it's really nice and flexible. But one thing, I, the biggest thing I found was, you know, still structure your day. Even if you're not floored to work eight to whatever, get, get up, get your clothes on, your work clothes, and get going. Otherwise, it's just your day. Other stuff happens and you don't be as productive. So. so were you working at home, like, before it was the thing to do in 2020? No, this was, no, after that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Most people do in this position. They work from home. Sure, I, I love it a lot. They give you a company <coughs> truck and you drive a, a lot, but it's not so bad. Gotcha. Yep. Yep. So would that be like your number one tip for like work at home is get up, get dressed, start doing stuff? Yes. Don't just get up and stay in your pajamas or something. You got to, it's very easy when you work from home to get sloppy with it. And so even from the start, I just said, I'm going to wake up. I'm going to be ready by this time every day. I'm going to be fully dressed ready to go and then try to work you know most days you're when you're busy yeah you're you're working till five but other days it's four or thirty you know whatever it's flexible so just staying disciplined with it is uh the biggest advice i would give yeah have you always been a disciplined person or do you feel like you you learned that at some point i feel like i've been pretty disciplined i've had a like in the summers i had a mainly an eight to five you know, I work for a farmer, so develop that structure. I guess I'm kind of used to that. If I don't do that, I feel guilty, <laughs> you know, during the day. So. Even as like a high schooler, you work eight to five in the summer. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Like yep. young. When was your When was your first job? Um, my first job was working at a grocery store. Okay. Um, you know, making minimum wage. That was more like at a night shift. Ooh. Ten to no seven to ten, a couple times a week, and then you know, X on weekends you work. Mm-hmm. Yeah whatever hours so it was enough to pay the gas which was what you needed um and then i think i worked full uh, old as i 16 when i started working for that farmer full-time in the summer and then part-time you know when he can in the fall so how'd you get how'd you get that job i mean <laughs> he was uh my brother was dating his daughter at the time easy in right there easy in, yeah. easy in yeah or it's not about it's not always who you know, it's how you know them. Right. Yep. That's what I like to say anyway. How you know them. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, that's how I got in there and loved it. You know, you're in a tractor most days, and it was pretty fun. Good guy to work for. Because does your family farm? My family does not anymore. We own okay. land. Right on. Um, but we used to farm. Yep. Right on. When I was younger. For sure. Yep. So then from 16, how long did that, that last it all the way through, like college? That same job or... I did some internships yeah. in between there, but mm-hmm. yeah, it was a lot of summers until, you know, in college I did an internship. So 2017, maybe, I don't know. It was quite a few summers. Yeah. Paid good. And, you know, it was nice. Learned a lot. Learned a lot. And, you know, I was big into sports too. So you'd say whenever you got something going on with sports, just take off and let me know. And that was nice. Because baseball was kind of your jam. Yeah. 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 Which in Minnesota they play in the spring, yes, not the summer. So you could you could work in the summer. Yeah, we would start in March. And, okay, and then that rolled into, you know, if you did well into June, and right. then summer ball would start. That'd go up till September. Oh, time frame something like that. 
Would summer ball. Both? What's that? Would you play both summer and spring? Yeah. 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 Summer was or spring was school ball and then summer was like a legion VFW and then turned into amateur ball. You know, amateur, we have amateur team there. So played that for a few years and then we, well, we moved. So kind of put a kibosh on that. It's legit. How's yeah. the how's the arm nowadays? Ah, it's good now. I guess. It's good. <laughs> No damage from throwing so much. No, but I did hurt my back. Um, I was gonna, I was going. I went to SDS, no, I was to St. Cloud first to play baseball. Hurt my back in high school, and I tried to play through it, and I just I couldn't even bend over anymore. Decided um, was at that point, you know, you go see a doctor, and they're like, "Yep, let's just quickly do a surgery, knock it out." Dude, and I had a slip disc that pinched a nerve down my leg. I played through my whole senior year, and it just got to the point where it hurt so bad to bend over and all that. So I uh, played fall ball there at St. Cloud and then had the surgery. And I was like, oh, yeah, you'll be done in a, in a month. You'll be good to go. And it just didn't progress very well. Um, couldn't really do a whole lot. So then I decided to go to SDSU and go the agronomy route. So Right on. Yep. So how is your back better now? I mean, it's not something you still – or is it still a nagging thing that you deal it's with? It's a nagging thing. Yeah, I, I'm. It. Uh, I would play baseball a lot. You know, twisting it comes back. Um, but um, I noticed is after I had the surgery, it was just a micro. It was a micro disectomy. Yeah. Now I have lower back pain. Mm. You know, from if you don't have good lumbar support, my back just blows up. Never had that before the surgery. So I don't know if that's just. Muscle issues there, they tore apart. I don't know. It was a small little incision, but it made a big difference. So know. part of that disc is removed then. Correct. But yeah. uh, what did they say, a peanut or a peanut M&M? That was the size of what they took out? I think that's what he said. Or maybe it was just an, an M&M, you know, a smaller. I think it had to have been that because the peanut m were pretty big. But I think it was like an M&M size so they scraped yeah. off and took out. Crazy. Yeah. yeah, that's wild. It hurts my heart a little bit to just like a kid that young going through all that that's like something that happens i mean if it happens at all it's like 50 60 70 years old right. you're slipping discs and all that but my dad had the same surgery really when he was older i think he was like 40 or something like that um so we had the same kind of deal going on just took less time <laughs> for that to happen um but yeah it's not not fun but i tried i tried a few chiropractors and stuff they weren't your level your you know it's Isaiah practice. Sure. So they just crack in. Yeah. yeah. We'll try it. Didn't work. <laughs> you know, if yep. I had, it was in nowadays, I think you guys could have taken care of it. At least we try to go deep. We try, we try to go hard, Isaiah and I, which Isaiah, your brother in law, who was yes. on here, episode 12 or whatnot, he and Caleb, they were on here, which, yeah, man, gosh, if only, if only I'd been there for you. That's how I feel. <laughs> Sorry. Which, it all worked out good. It yeah. all worked out. Got a beautiful wife and two wonderful kids. So there you go. That's all that matters. So it's not slowing you down, back pain. Well, <laughs> I uh, do a lot of CrossFit stuff, and normally mm-hmm. it's good. But then it was about a month and a half ago, I sprained my that same L five, um, slipped or sprained or whatever you want to call it. Ah, so still dealing with that, I guess. So there's some things where it's like, yeah, maybe I'm not not going to do that. Yeah, I don't do much deadlift. Sure. And go very heavy on that sort of stuff right. and try to avoid that. Yeah. Was there a, an original injury way back in high school? Was it like, oh, there it was, or did it kind of gradually come on? Uh, what I remember was you, know, you do lunges, like weighted lunges. Mm-hmm. I remember mm-hmm. one, I was doing one one leg. I don't know which one it was, but I felt something slip back there, like a pinch. Mm-hmm. Got off. like, ah, it feels kind of weird, didn't hurt. And then that was the beginning of this, this, that school year, so it was probably like August. And then it just progressed and got worse and worse and worse. Dang. Yeah. Through basketball, it was pretty bad. And then baseball, I had to get a couple uh, – don't judge me. I didn't know. Hey. Fast, but I did a couple <laughs> cortisone shots. Unfiltered, bro. There's no, which, it's uh, a no judgment zone. <laughs> big giant knife or, you know, needle going in. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's like a Band-Aid for a couple weeks, and then it right, right, comes right back. Wild. Yeah. I was wondering if there was one big injury because, like, reminds me of you <laughs> – <laughs> going head first into a snowbank. Oh and yeah. Oof. Waking up in a hospital. Yeah. That was my sophomore year. 
I was up in uh, Minnesota, actually, at Afton Alps, and uh, youth group ski trip. Oh. And uh, we were on the, like, freestyle course, and I thought I could do some kind of trick, but I <laughs> couldn't. So, yeah, I landed on my head, woke up in the hospital, like, a day later. Did you, like, Gosh. knocked out? Or oh, yeah. Like, yeah, I had a... Crushed your spine or something? Or? Um, I landed, like... On my face, on the left side, like I had uh, like a face mask on and it left like imprints where the little breathing holes were at. Wow. Um, I think I had a hematoma. Pretty sure that's what it's called, like a bleed on the brain. Oh, wow. And so they were looking at like a surgery to open my cranium and reduce pressure, but they didn't do that. Wow. Um, yeah, I was in ICU at Gillette um, for four days, I think, and then came home. And wow. was out of school for like a month. Just they said... You shouldn't be thinking. Don't use your brain at all. Wow. wow. So, yeah, that that was that's intense. Sophomore year. Jeez. Haven't been snowboarding since. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't either. <laughs> no ski trips for you. Well, I I'd like to go again. I'm just gonna wear a helmet probably. <laughs> yeah. That's wild. Yeah, that's it was, wild. It was a bad phone call for my youth pastor to have to make. <laughs> <laughs> Where, where were your parents? Your parents weren't. They were in Winterset, Iowa at home. They were, okay. I was right with on. my youth pastor and like 20 other kids. Wow. And then it's like, oh, Isaac's not waking up. Just like, okay, call 911 and then. So I was like, call the, you know, the Mounties out ah. here to bring the sleds yeah. and. Take the four wheeler Take them on a you. gurney and yeah. yeah, ambulance ride to the hospital. And yeah, it was a whole, whole thing. Back and then. You slept through all of it. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, that that would be kind of terrifying as like the counselor of all that. Was it Mike? Was it Mike? Yeah, Patterson? Pastor Mike. Yeah. Oh, Mike, bless your heart for all you had to deal with. <laughs> oh, <damn>. This guy, <laughs> no kidding. You put him through a lot, like, didn't uh, you? Yeah, yeah. Like at that rehearsal dinner when I was like, I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for you. Like, there were a lot of moments. That Literally, he got to I share could with be me. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, even like to know who to call or how to call. It's like on the mountain. I mean, did you did he have a cell phone or like? Did Col- he... Colton was with me. Okay. So I think he called his dad and was like, "Hey, we need help." Isaac <laughs> is unconscious. Something bad happened. Might be dead. <laughs> <laughs> there's actually, it'd be tough to find it. I think my dad tried to like hide it, but there's a video of it because you know I was gonna like do this great trick. Oh no, kidding! So Colton like is taking video, oh, and you just see me like it. And bounce, and then oh. just go limp. I, I would like to see this video. Yeah, I don't know if I'd be able to find it, <laughs> but but you saw it. I've I've seen it like one time. Oh now. my gosh! Wow. Yeah, it was pretty intense. I've never been injured like that. No. Nope. I uh, I did slip a disc, <laughs> deadlifting. Lo and behold, and it was some CrossFit workout. And I like CrossFit if you're doing it right and you's not being. Stupid. Stupid. There's the word. <laughs> Correct. Guys that are trying to push too yeah. hard. And, and I was. Got to use good form. I was yes. pushing too hard, too heavy. And it was some workout that you had to deadlift like 50 times. And Ugh. then it was running and then pull ups and then deadlifting. And I was on my 31st rep of 245 pounds. And then there it went. And I like crawled to Isaiah. And no. Jenny Nordman, thank you. She was there. Pretty sure Julia was there. Just our kind of clan at the chiropractor school. And then. Yeah, like nine days later, I felt good, went back to the gym and picked up just a barbell, 45 pounds, and the same thing happened again. Mm. And it's like, okay, this is a good learning experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Crawled back to the chiropractor, and two months later, I was fine, which I'm not chiropractor school. There's no better place to have something like that happen, which makes me just like, yeah, you know, a lot of things could have been, maybe, I don't know, I can't say with any confidence, maybe your situation could have been prevented had you been at chiropractor school with the rest of us, or <laughs> you had probably uh, better form too, you better know, because you're lifting young and they don't really teach you the best form. Right. Looking yeah. back, you know, that probably didn't help things out too yeah. much. Yeah. I've been very impressed with our high school lifting. They have like a lifting program now and they have like a lifting class and like during school, they'll take athletes and they'll go to the weight room. And I'm pretty sure coaches are there like mm-hmm. teaching them form, which mm-hmm. is something that I don't think we did a whole lot back in the day, but now it's like, People are getting smarter. Yeah. Realizing that they want your athletes to, to perform for a long time, you got to keep them healthy. You're I right. will say, huh. bigger town, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. We had that at my high school when yeah. I was in high school. Yeah. It was awesome. Right. <laughs> yeah. It takes a little while for knowledge to get to some of these small towns. Yeah. I feel like. Yeah. 
we're always a little bit behind some of the urban areas. Mm-hmm. Maybe. I don't know how true that is, but I think sometimes there's just like the attitude too of like, well, this is how we've always done it. You know, we bigger, faster, stronger. Sure. Just yeah. we bench, we squat. <laughs> I was pretty much we a deadlift. I remember, <laughs> remember there, was, there was a big difference in kids. There's some kids that just you know can't lift much. And I remember distinctly this this one kid that he was a big football player and he would he would well, I don't know what he was doing like a push press of like three fifteen as like a junior. Like, wow, that's crazy. That's yeah, that's yeah. that's a workhorse right there. That's a sure. horse of a human. <laughs> Politely, I say that with respect. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it brings back an image to me of like this kid doing a, a bench press and he had just like this barrel chest and these little tiny arms. <laughs> and I mean, that bar was moving like four inches maximum. Yeah. It was just like that. Yeah. And he had all this weight on it. And, you know, Ooh. everybody's like, oh, yeah, that's awesome. But it's like, what are you really, that's, that's what are you really doing there, there? kid? Yeah. You know? Yeah, everyone knows the people that go to the gym and throw on all this weight and they go down like this far in a squat. Like, yeah. Oh, Cut that weight in half and go down on the way. I bet you right. more out of it. Those are some like, of the, the best videos to watch on YouTube. It's the weightlifting <laughs> fails. Yeah, those people those think they're yeah. That like makes my knees hurt. Yeah. One well, of the Ugh. biggest things you learned is uh, like if you're benching by yourself, don't put the clips on. Right. Then you can just go like this and Slide they fall off. And then mm. you yep. see those people that don't do that and then just sits on their chest and they like try to get out with their Bad. head. That's so mess. Yeah, Gotta use right. the catch bars. That's what those are for. Yes. <laughs> crazy it's just like that temptation to like make it look like you can do more than Mm -hmm. you can really do it's like oh this will be impressive because look at how much weight's on there but it's like what you're actually gaining is so much less right for sure it's like the desire to have the approval of others Mm -hmm. that's like a big thing in the gym i think oh yeah at least at a young age yeah was for me like I'm, I was a tiny kid, so I couldn't do a lot. So <laughs> I'm like, let's at least get the 45s on. Right. Know? Right. Yeah, that was like initiation. Can you do plates? I remember ninth grade <laughs> geometry class. There was an upperclassman in that class, and he was asking me, so can you can you bench plates, Liet? Like, that was the, whether you were cool or not, depended on whether or not you could bench 135. Mm. Plates. In, plates. In uh, football, we actually had a pretty cool thing at the beginning of the year. I don't know what it was called. Cardinal Pride. Yeah, that's what it was. And they'd go through basically this big circuit. It's a competition to see who's the most strongest or fit. Mm-hmm. It was nice because they actually had good standard um, standards for form. So like you'd go a bench. Yeah, you have to hit. You have to go you know parallel or lower, and then your weights, your score, and then you have like shuttle runs, mile time. That was really uh-huh. cool. Um, yeah, there's one kid that just dominated it because he was just a. Super strong and fast, and the three fifteen kid push pushing. I was a, no, it was a different, different kid, guy. But <laughs> that guy might have had a harder time with the mile. Probably, probably a lot of muscle to move right. around that track. How? Where were you? How were you and all that? I don't even remember. Yeah, I think I did pretty well. I think I know my junior year, it was pretty hard, and then I think I like get to that exhaustion where you like want to throw up. <laughs> yes, I remember that. Right. But, yeah, it was fun. Makes me think of a video I saw the other day. You know who, like, the Beast is? I forget his name. First and last name. He's a guy from, like, Britain. He's the guy that uh, deadlifted 1,000 pounds, oh. half a ton. What's the guy's name? name? Uh, he was probably at that Rogue. Was yeah, that yeah, Rogue yeah. Rogue Heavy Man. Yeah. Oh, I know I can name. Google it quick. Yeah, yeah. if you can yeah. get the name. Anyway, Keep chatting. he calls himself the Beast. It's tattooed on his arms. And um, I saw he did a challenge. Eddie. Eddie Hall. Eddie Hall, yeah, that's it. Be- beat ya. Cool. <laughs> cool. He, he was, like, working out with this Navy SEAL, and he was trying to do this, like, Navy SEAL standard test, and it was, like, you got to do this many pull-ups in a row, this many sit-ups, mm-hmm. this many push-ups, and, like, run and swim this far, this fast. And, like, he had a horrible – he was struggling. I mean, hardcore. And it's just because, like, he has so much mass – he couldn't move it, right. and it was just like amazing to me to watch the body type because it's like here, here's this guy that can, I mean, move more weight than like anybody else on the planet, yeah. but you know, you ask him to run this, you know, one and a half mile time at whatever standard, and it's just like can't happen because there's so much weight his body can't right. move like that, but it can do other things that no one else could do. Right. Yeah. Pretty intense, dude. Yeah. 
The beast. The beast. Yeah. Yep. Hey. It's different body types, different. Right. Whatever works. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know. He, I don't know if he's the CrossFit type. Probably not. <laughs> probably not that. Probably, probably wouldn't work out too well. No. Maybe not. Yeah. That's why I do admire CrossFit is because they, they focus on such a variety of skills. You watch the CrossFit games, and the first event is almost always in the water. Yep. And then, like, you might be fast on land or really strong, but if you can't swim or, like, paddle a paddleboard, which is an inapplicable real-life kind of activity, that's you're going you're gonna to struggle, and you're not going to win because you're not the jack-of-all-trades that fitness kind of or the CrossFit community kind of aspires to be is fully functional, functional movement, right? right. Is that how you understand CrossFit? Yeah. I mean, it... it you got to be balanced on yeah. like everything. I mean, they're doing now. Yeah. Now they're doing handstands over right. um, ramps and railings, mm-hmm. doing handstand walks. I mean, it's it's definitely different than it was in 07. Right. You know, when you watch that and those mm-hmm. those athletes, like, granted, yeah, those are the people who started. Right. The athletes then won't even come close to qualifying nowadays right. for the games. But now you're seeing interesting. You're seeing the younger kids come up. I mean, there's like 18 year old girls that are in the top 10. Right. You have a 22 year old guy that won it last year. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. and he's been doing it for years. He did mm-hmm. the youth, et cetera. And now I mean, he trains with Frazier and yeah, it's just, you'll see them be younger and younger. It's better and better. Cause there's, they're starting to focus on those like weird skills sooner. And mm-hmm. then now it's just like, you're about as good as you can be as yeah. a human can be walking on your hands across Something made by AAI, actually. They're the uh, handstand walk apparatus that they used at the CrossFit Games was made at AAI. Really? So you can see that, or made at AAI, which is in Jefferson. Yeah. yeah. Their logo is on it, which is cool. Wow. Yeah. Puts the Jefferson on the map. For sure. <laughs> AAI and Powerlift. It's like pretty cool. Yeah, I love that stuff. I think Powerlift is so cool, mm-hmm. too. Because they... Uh, it was not. It was last year's Super Bowl. It was the Chiefs and maybe the Bucks, mm-hmm. or yeah, yeah it was. Yeah. They both have mm-hmm. powerlift weight rooms, which is like made in Jefferson, Iowa. These NFL teams using powerlift stuff. That's I'm pretty cool. sure Tyler got to work on both of their gyms, which is neat. Tyler's the bomb. <laughs> he is. I Tyler, like him. yeah, he knows his stuff. <laughs> Hope so. Hope <laughs> We're married, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> I better like him. It's awesome. Anyway, man, that's cool. Well, this is totally changing gears here, but I definitely want to see you drink this. In, <laughs> in today's episode of Make Isaac Try Stuff, we have raw, unpasteurized milk, which, for the record, is illegal to sell. So we, we didn't, I mean, it's, this, is le- this is legal. I just want to, I just want to make, this, <laughs> yeah. make this known. Okay, I didn't buy this in Iowa because that's not, you can't do that. Right. But it was, it was gifted. Yes. So that's that's what this is. I know we've made you try kombucha before. Yeah. <laughs> uh, can I tell you a funny story about kombucha? Yes, you can. Shortly after my trying it, I don't know if this had any impact on the way events progressed, but my dad has started to brew his own kombucha oh, in yeah. my basement really? at our house. Oh wow. yeah, he loves it. He loves it. <laughs> he takes one at least one to work every day and drinks it, it every so day. Funny. My dad is like into the kombucha thing. What's he What's he like about it? Is it just like how it tastes? He, or? Like, <laughs> he likes that it's healthy and he likes that it's fizzy and he likes that he can make it taste different ways. That is awesome. So <laughs> it's like for him, it's like an alternative to pop that he is just all about. That is awesome. That's so, cool. Yeah. Because pop, I mean, you're, you've, you've got a pop drinking clan over there or are they all kind of moving away from pop now i wouldn't say that they're not no. all trying to move away from I, it i wouldn't necessarily no. say that i mean i think my mom did tell you that she had reduced her that coke intake <laughs> yeah yeah i think she told you that yeah so. yeah i mean there's less of it um yeah less of it going to cole Cole bruce yeah a couple Kombucha of rock stars brewers. man that's awesome he's a just so you know, he's like the only one in the house. He's the only it. one. Yeah. <laughs> For now. He tries to like get, get yeah. other people to try it. I, I had some. It wasn't bad. Yeah. I can't get on the kombucha train. I think it's all right. Yeah. I want to like it. It's like too much for me, though. Zevia is perfect. Do you know that like, there's uh, different kombuchas you can buy? That mm-hmm. are, some are better than others. Yes. Like the kombuchas, mm-hmm. I found out, have a different, they use a different type of bacteria. Mm. That actually is bad for you. Oh no! So, 
<laughs> Kavita. It, it, it tastes distinctly different. It's awesome. It is the best tasting stuff. Kavita. It's the Synergy <laughs> does too. Because it's bad for you. <laughs> the yeah. The other one does too. Synergy uses a, a not so good. Well, yeah. There's, you have to ask Katie on that. Okay. I kind of read on that. So. What about the Health Aid? Do you know that brand? I think those are good. Those are good. There, if you look on the Kavita, there's a, on the back um, list, there's a word that sounds like a bacteria name, and that's what they use. Okay. I mean, like normally using that SCOBY. Yep. And I guess they use something different. Oh, it's fascinating. Really bad for your gut. Oh, well, good. Teacher. <laughs> oh, now we got to go check all of our kombucha. That just, yeah, kind of shredded. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They've tainted the In goodness that, of kombucha. You know, who can you trust anymore? I just feel so betrayed. So we all just need to start yeah. making our own in the basement. <laughs> you know? Maybe maybe that's the way. It's just. <laughs> we used to make it. Did you? It's just such a process, though. Right. You got to be So much on, effort. I guess it, it, if you don't do it strict, it doesn't turn out as good. So it stopped. Yeah. Well, that's why. Oh gosh, jeez, <laughs> things. So many things are ruined in the the production form, which is why it's so fascinating to talk about seed and its production because we're talking about a ma- millions of pounds, like a massive amount of product that makes the world go. Like Iowa in the Midwest, I mean, is the world's leading producer. No, no, like Iowa in its area, no one produces more corn or beans than Iowa or hogs for that matter. You know, it's just like if we get interrupted, like the world goes hungry in a way, you know, but it's like in that mass scale production, things get tainted sometimes, which frustrates me. But it's like you got to make money. Yeah. All things flow through the funnel of money, unfortunately, you know. Very true. So, yet here we have some raw unpasteurized milk which it's fascinating because this is the new thing on the street and the new, new thing on the trend. street the new health trend <laughs> it's because a lot of people are lactose intolerant but now they're coming out and saying that they are not bothered by the lactose the natural lactase that is in this okay even though it's still there it's been the lactose has been damaged in its production process mm-hmm. so then that's the thing that's not tolerable right in your body so we've Let's actually see. done some our own little testing of that. Yeah. So we'll drink just that and then we'll switch and drink like half and half. You know, that's pasture, ultra pasteurized and whatever. That bothers me. This stuff doesn't. And what we used to cut out all dairy, you know, besides butter. And, you know, you drink something, you get kind of congested mm-hmm. to drink some dairy. Mm-hmm. We started drinking this. We noticed that for a couple of days, or maybe a week or whatever. And now it doesn't, doesn't bother us at all. So it's like, I don't know if your body adjusts. Yeah. To that or whatever, but yeah, it doesn't it doesn't bother us at all. Well, speaking of bacteria, it's got its own natural bacteria strains in there, which is probably like a foreign thing to your gut. But once you populate it with that and it starts to grow and become synergetic with the rest of what's in your gut, it's probably like accepted then. Probably, yeah. So, dude, bottoms up, man. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't have any issues with lactose, just to put out there. <laughs> excited to try it. Tell us how it tastes. Tastes like milk. I mean, yeah. Remarkably, just you know, it's raw, like straight from the yeah. cow, but yeah. yet tastes the same. Can you sense anything drastically different, texture mm-hmm. or? Did, did you notice like a less, you know, like milk's got a very distinct taste to it? Yeah. Do you notice a little less of that? Yeah, I do. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is like a little bit creamier than what a normal milk would be, like just slightly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, almost has like a. I don't know, like, I want to say, like, a smoothie-like quality to it. Mm -hmm. So that's nice. For a second there, I almost thought I was tasting something a little weedy, but maybe not. Wheat? Weedy? (laughs) Yeah, a little wheaty. I guess that's the, the, like, way I'd describe it, I guess. But I get what you mean. Like, yeah, that that taste that milk has a lot of the time. A taste I like, by the way. Mm -hmm. It's, It's definitely not as, like, pronounced. It's good. I would drink this often. Dude, I think health is going to look so different in 10 years, you know, just as like we learn more. In the, in the last 10 years, I feel like almond milk and oat milk and all these alternative dairy right. products have come out. But then now it's like, well, these things in order to be mass produced and to taste good and have a good mm-hmm. texture, you've got a lot of these gums and things in it to... Oil. Hoofas. Mm-hmm. polyunsaturated fats, which are not the best thing for your body. And so, boy, 
I think everything's going to change because they all these fads. It's like they come up and then it's like, well, if you're really trying to be healthy or people start noticing they're having issues, kind of like what you're saying is, and I felt it too. There's just things that bother my gut when I do a lot of these alternative things. And then all of a sudden we're going back to the raw form, which was mm-hmm. just fine all along, right. you know? And so it's like, as more of this knowledge and these fad trends kind of pop up and then we learn more about how it's going to affect us, man. Yeah. It's just going to get better and better and better. I think. Hey, look at the back of a gluten-free, whatever bread. I mean, Boy. look at the ingredients on that. You're like that's wow. It's nasty. Yeah. Garbage. Yeah. You know that. So right. It's, it's probably fake. not good. For yeah. You. All yeah. chemical. Yeah. You know. All just to cut out gluten, which maybe is misunderstood. Right. Maybe there's like for instance, Katie's brother Jake is is gluten intolerant, but he here the food here he went to Poland and ate there didn't bother him one bit just came back here same thing has issues yeah they've got stricter food rules over in right. europe about what you can and cannot do to food yeah food dyes and stuff like that super regulated over there so it's something we're doing is not quite as natural as it could be correct yeah yes that bothers me too because mm-hmm. i don't necessarily know what that is what it is about that but i don't know if it's like the, the variety type of just on a basic level Maybe that's that. Maybe it's just the type, the variety of wheat. Maybe mm-hmm. it's what we do to them. Maybe it's what we spray on them. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But there's a difference. I mean, that's a firsthand experience of there's something that's different. Which is hard to ignore. You know, there might not be the scientific room. We were talking about this last time on the podcast. You know, there might not be all this scientific documented research. But how do you ignore repetitive anecdotal experience of like well i eat this and i'm fine and i eat this exact same thing made over here and i'm not fine like right but you're just supposed to like keep eating the thing that's supposed to be good for you like no i'm not gonna keep doing that i'm gonna do what like works and mm-hmm. everyone's health journey is so i mean it's different you know it's different yeah. you can't just put in a, a standard protocol and be like eat this do this this at this time blah 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 boom 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 abc this will be then you'll be healthy which makes my job hard because (laughs) there's times where it's like, this should work. You should be getting better and you're not. And it's because we've got to tailor things to fit you. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the bigger things to start with is cut out preservatives, Mm -hmm. go down that road first. I think that's the biggest issue. Um, And then stem from there. Preservatives and added sugar would be. So those are things that it's like, they're pretty much always going to be bad. It's never like, oh, I'm missing that. I can't even think of one off the top of my head. Potassium citrate or a preservative like that. That Oh, that's what my body needs to finally get healthy. Like, no, <laughs> right. that's, that's never, that's not it. Right. That's not it. I think there's misunderstanding though, like with the majority of people. I think for a lot of people that they've like gotten a really reduced picture, at least on the dietary side of things. Like, oh, I just need to like not eat as many carbs and, you know just sugar in general. If I can get away from however many grams of sugar is in that, then I'm good. I think that's where like, you know, a diet product or something like that has been promoted at times is really healthy. I think about, you know, when kind of the like space age of food things came about. I mean, I I saw something not that long ago and it was like food trends over the years. And like one of the things, there was a time where they like made everything into jello like make mm-hmm. your make your entire dinner a jello dish. Like there's just been trends of weird stuff like that. And it's like here's a product that has been made by somebody. You know, some of it is probably real and some of it's probably fake because it doesn't really look like food, but that's interesting. So right. let's try it. Oh, and it tastes good, so must be okay to eat. Uh, I heard Oh no, you keep going. But the only other thing I was really going to add to that, and I told you about this not that long ago, but I heard somebody like talking on a lecture and they talked about, you know, long ago, um, we just knew what was right to eat based on the way it looked, based on the way it tasted, based on the way it smelled. Like we have senses that should tell us what is good to eat and what's not good to eat. But they said, you know, what's happened in the food industry, and I'm not an expert on this by any means, but... They said there's been, you know, deception put into our food where now right. it looks good even though it's full of chemicals. Yep. It smells good and tastes good, but that's a result of, like, what they put perfumes in and right. chemicals yeah. to, make it, to make it yeah. appealing even though it's full of junk. Well, like they used to say, salt's bad for you. When, you can fact check me on this, but it was, I think it was more of the, the iodized 
Mm-hmm. The table salt. The table salt. Mm-hmm. The stuff they put in the salt. The salt's good for you. You need the salt. Mm-hmm. Same with butter. They thought butter was bad. Well, maybe it was actually the margin, margarine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Fake butter. Right. That yeah. caused issues. Yep. You know, it's the stuff that we're doing to this food that yes. leads right. to all these issues. Right. When you when you take something raw and organic made from the earth and you mess it up, it's <laughs> right. It's not the same. Yes. I think really just the point I was trying to make is I think for the people whose education on diet comes from commercials for synthetic products, yes, oof, like how do you how do you come to understand that it's not good just because it has zero grams of fat, but it's actually full of, you know, whatever else. It's I don't know right. what it's full of, but like they're like the f- the food pyramid in school when pizza mm-hmm. pizzas on there. <laughs> like, oh, come on, I know they're trying to say probably say carbs. Well, they they called they called it pizza a vegetable one time. I remember it that. It's like a serving, that. serving a vegetable. One yeah. serving of vegetable because was got tomato pizza. sauce on it. Because tomatoes, the tomato sauce. Oh my gosh! It's just funny because now they're like, tomatoes are a fruit. Yeah, it's yeah. silly. <laughs> it is silly. It is silly. Yeah. So I, I have faith because there's these. Yeah, if you <laughs> if you watch TV, commercials are bad, man. It's like, I mean. If you're being, you're being, you're trying to be sold something. Like someone wants your money. Right. They're not out to make you healthier or fitter or better in any way. They're there to like sell something and make themselves richer. Right. So it's the moment anyone tries to sell me something, I'm kind of like, ah, <laughs> frustrated about it. Yes. You know, like a product that is obviously man-made, yes. non-organic. The, the ones that make me laugh are the, the prescription ones that, it's always the same. It's this, this stuff, person that's doing something in life, like throwing right. a frisbee to a dog, and they talk about whatever X brand or X thing this is, and then at the end they speak really fast. All the side effects, like you will probably mm-hmm. die, you will have heart, <laughs> like heart attack, like yeah. stroke. I mean, it's oh, okay, just ignore that. Right. It's just silly. Or yeah, this is a rabbit hole right here, <laughs> but it's the certain uh, there's antidepressants that have a black box warning, which means they may, like, uh, there's risk of suicide. They may, like, cause suicidal thoughts. And that's a black box warning is something that, like, can potentially kill you by taking this pharmaceutical, wow. which is usually not something that's, like, super upfront right. when it's... And I like, I like hospitals. I love hospitals and I love doctors because they save a lot of lives. But it's, like, on the... On the not for wellness... Not for wellness, you know. Right. I think there's other there's other yeah. ways. There's a poster in my office that said, "Let let let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food," which is you know we've gotten away from that in a long time. And the picture of health has changed, and I hope we're going somewhere different in the next ten years. I read something recently, and probably checked to see how true it is, but on average, a, a doctor will go through what eight years, and they'll spend it was a crazy low number, like an hour, on actual health. Not like prescriptions, that sort of thing. Ugh. But like, I don't want to say nat- more natural stuff. It's like an hour. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Something crazy like that. It's different. Yeah. yeah it's well, like, different. hey, I mean, you go there, you broke an arm, they do a phenomenal yeah. job. Yeah. The, the advances we've had mm-hmm. in medicine is crazy. Don't come to me with a broken Grateful. arm. <laughs> right. No. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I just think there's money talks a little too much. Yeah. yeah that's money. all I'll say. All things flow through the funnel of money. You know, it makes me think, we talked about like farming practices earlier, and it. I feel like this conversation relates to that because just like you were talking about, you know, there's going to come a point where we have to kind of do things a different way, and it's just going to go that direction because what we're doing isn't really working for soil health. Right. I think in the wellness sector, there's probably going to be some sort of rise in similar sense that if we see it's not working people are gonna change and do something else hopefully yeah. it's like uh the great depression time when we had the dust bowl mm-hmm. i mean a lot of that was from intensive tillage and they after that they learned you know so we'll, we'll learn keep something. learning hopefully right. hopefully it just comes about naturally not like a disaster type thing but right it, I was at trivia the other night at Hy-Vee, which happens every Thursday at 6 p.m. <laughs> and the guy running the trivia had a tattoo on his arm that said "Still Learning," and that kind of stuck out to our little squad that was there doing trivia. Just because, nice. like, should never quit. Yeah. The moment you quit learning, like, 
everything else starts to pass you by. Right. Like you get stuck or you get left behind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Learn. Grow. Got to grow. Very true. Yeah. How do we get to a lighter topic? That was kind of, <laughs> that was mildly <laughs> intensive as we rag on what's wrong oh, in the world. Man. Talk about Joe Rogan. That's not very, uh, that's, very light. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's light either. <laughs> Right, that's because that was. Uh, did you say that was the third leading trending thing on yeah, Twitter? Yeah, it, was, it is, was among the top things. The Rogan controversy. Cause what did you say? Like 70, 70 episodes of his got removed. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Basically, it's one one side trying to silence another side. I mean, what my opinion of that is, I mean, Rogan's very good at creating conversation and asking questions, tough questions that mm-hmm. people don't think is right to ask right now. And that's why he's trying to get silenced, in my opinion. And, uh, yeah, it's just had to see. Because anytime you, you censor like that, you, you infringe on free speech. Right. you got to think critical. If you, basically what the, what's happening right now is that people are being blocked from thinking critically. You're not allowed to think against this, even though it keeps changing constantly. You know what I mean? So anytime you stop thinking critically... I, th- I think the desire to shut down any sort of like conversation about something is, is a dangerous thing. I've, I've heard people make the reference like, you know, let's look back at history and can you name one time where the people silencing others and saying don't talk about that were the ones that came out on the right side right. of history. Correct. Mm. Basically, I, basically, that's what happened in World War II. In, yeah. in a sense, you, you're not told to think. You're basically brainwashed to think one way and you're not allowed to think out against it yeah yeah it's deeper deeper here. <laughs> I was gonna say, we're this going there not get lighter <laughs> we're going there you know <laughs> yeah which the truth will come out right i mean you can't keep the truth hidden forever right. even like when you think about world war ii like there there was there was a breakthrough in that mm-hmm. and i don't know what kind of an era we're in now but ideally there's going to be a breakthrough again the beauty of it is the war has already been won. So Amen. we already know the outcome to that. Right on. No. That's true. That was a light note right there. That was good. Or at least a victorious one. Yeah. Yeah. Truth. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Boy. <laughs> Take a breath. <laughs> Take a breath. <laughs> been going for like an hour 20. That's what happens when you get going. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just creative conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. What, uh, have you been watching anything recently? Besides Yellowstone, because I know you've been into Yellowstone here and there. 1883, which is a spinoff, basically. (laughs) Yeah. Pretty good. Pretty good. I I just like it because it's got a historical side of things to Mm -hmm. it. I mean, it's it's rough. You know, it's a rough show, but it kind of depicts the truth of what it was like to, you know, go across the country in a a wagon that you've never been anywhere, you know. So it's it's cool. It's there's some sad spots and but it's it's truth i think heavy but yet <clears throat> historical and yeah. entertaining mhm well you haven't his, i haven't seen it no. but basically what that story is about is there's a family which is Tim McGraw and Faith Hill and their family That's are, cool. are going it's from them. Tennessee they're trying to go up to i think they're going to Wyoming but they they're in Texas is where it all starts there's another Sam Elliott's in there and he just lost his family to measles oh wow mm-hmm. Measles or mumps, one of the two. And the big opening scene is him. His family has died, and he burns the house down and leaves. So sure. Just row right away. Um, but then he gets paid to take a immigrant group from, I think a lot of them are, from, are German, I think, from that. Time. Yeah. And they get paid to take them to Utah. And then it's just tough. It's fun. It's funny entertaining because the group it doesn't have any guns they don't know how to swim which they have to cross countless rivers and they don't you know they don't know anything about survival and they have to go and take them i mean through through the wilderness through indian land etc so crazy yeah a real oregon trail type of legit yeah, yeah. legit oregon trail story yeah i mean like they show crazy things like well i'm not gonna get too descriptive i guess but <laughs> Like a rattlesnake bites somebody and sure. they pass. So, you know, it's just crazy stuff like that. And 
legit Oregon Trail like that happened in the game at least. <laughs> I remember that. But it's like, <laughs> hey, by the way, that was real life. Yes. You know? right. yeah. I can't imagine America in 1883, undeveloped. Yeah. yeah. No. It'd be cool to see. Yeah. yeah. It would. Yeah. Man. What have you been watching? I've been watching. Or reading. Maybe more reading for you. Uh, I've been reading about Smith Wigglesworth the most lately. Smith. Yeah. Did you say Wigglesworth? That's what I said. Wow. wow. That's a last name. Rama? Rama guy? No, he oh. was um, an English minister from okay. a long time ago. And I know him, but I guess I don't know his biography. He's just just had a lot of really miraculous accounts, mm-hmm. a lot of um, miraculous healings, <laughs> and just incredible things that happened in his ministry. I mean, a lot of like had to be miracles, no other explanation, um, things that occurred. Like, I mean, like one of the things um, I was just reading about the other day is like he came up to pray for this woman who had like a tumor on her nose. And when he put his hand on her and, you know, used the name of Jesus and he said it just like fell off of her face. And nice. several things just like that that had happened. And mm-hmm. Yeah, just someone who walked very closely with the Lord, but... Kind of a cool background. He was a, a plumber for years before, like uneducated. Really, no one saw him as being anything great. But you know, he just devoted his life to the Word and the Lord, and he was used. So awesome. I find that pretty inspiring. Amen. So like that. I've also been watching Star Trek. So on oh. a different note, that's <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Taylor and I we watched a show called Lost in Space. Like a month ago, yeah, I watched I, that. I liked it. Yeah, it was I good. thought it was really good. Mm-hmm. It was a light-hearted show, mm-hmm. but interesting enough to kind of keep you nice. coming back. And so after that, I was like, "Well, I kind of am on the space kick." Space train. So, so mm-hmm. put on, uh, yeah, Star Trek. Wow, <laughs> I've got a range, man. <laughs> Came away with a lot of things to check out this yeah, episode. Yes, you know, you starting with Clarkson's farm. Have you guys uh, read *Mere Christianity*? Yes. Oh, that's I just I'm like on like I don't know hundred hundred page maybe but that's that's deep you gotta really mm-hmm. pay attention to that correct that's really good yeah I would say essential Very. for you know the spiritual journey and acknowledging God mere Christianity is yeah, yeah. but he, I like because he touches a lot on um you know the issues with atheism and how uh, all points right back to God you know uh, it's it's deep, but it's a very good read. Yeah. yeah. All things require faith. Mm-hmm. We were just talking about that with someone yeah. about like you driving down a 60 mile an hour road and you're going one way and another car is coming the other way. And it takes an incredible amount of faith to believe like you're not just going to get in a head on fiery crash and be done. You right. know, like the amount of faith required in a moment to moment living is astonishing. Mm-hmm. Let alone it takes just as much faith to believe in a God as it takes faith to believe that there is no God. Mm-hmm. Because there's no like necessarily tangible proof, fully tangible proof of either. There's just the faith you have at some point to take you all the way there, one way or the other. It's like a experienced faith, though. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. you, you pray to God, you talk to God. If you're in tune with the Holy Spirit, God'll talk to you. That you know, right. it, you know what I'm saying here. Yeah. Um, that's how someone, my first pastor, explained it to me. Is it's an experienced faith. That if you're a believer, you will not have no doubt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's true. I, I also think it's just something to put out there. I was going to say you can probably clean up what I just said. Here, so <laughs> yeah, the, go ahead. Just, I would go just, ahead, just I would just thing. note on the on the note of like the tangible aspect. I mean, the world is evidence of right. God. I mean, evidence it says of that creation. in Romans that He reveals Himself to us through creation, and I mean all throughout cultures. I mean whether they want to say God or not. Well, that there is something greater than them. Right. So I think to say, yeah, like you put, you know, it takes faith in a sense to be an atheist or to not believe. I mean, it's, I mean, that's a deep conversation with someone, but I, I do think it is a, yeah, you really, you would have to be putting a lot of confidence into your, your way of thinking despite a lot of evidence to the contrary. One of my favorite quotes is what you think about God is the most important thing about you. Cause a lot of beliefs and thoughts derived come from that. 
mm-hmm. whether you know it or not. It's like your belief in God or the absence of God derives a lot of what you do and how you do it and a lot of your beliefs thereon too. So mm-hmm. it's an essential conversation. Just, I mean, we're alive. You're here, which is oh. a miracle. Right. Like two humans cross-pollinated and <laughs> made you, you know? <laughs> nice. And it's like, that's unbelievably amazing. It's the miracle of life is essentially should be admired and it's how it's done. Can't, we can't duplicate that. Man right. can't duplicate that. It's only like the essence of two people can do that, you know? Mm-hmm. So that miracle itself is like, well, you've got to try to understand how you came here at some point. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, an intelligent creator is, that's where I land. Yeah. yeah. You just look at what man, man creates and what God created. And there's just a huge there's a difference. It's a big difference. There's a difference. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, even, even I would say man's creation in general is a derivation of God's creation. I mean, without there being something at the start, we can't build right. anything. I mean, right. without the, you know, essential elements and the periodic table, yeah. I mean, we can't, we're not building houses or cities or phones or any of that stuff if we don't have right. his creation at the beginning anyway. And you mirror it. I mean, you right. think about things that we create that mirrors how God created, mm-hmm. like how our body works, for instance. Yeah. for instance yeah that's just fascinating mm-hmm. the, the complexity mm-hmm. that he made like that yeah. yeah we're gonna need to go round two for this we can come back down <laughs> later and yeah. do another this get is into a, that conversation get into that for sure your christianity that's deep that's a good recommendation right there it is I'm glad yeah. you're tackling that yeah it's, uh, it's gonna be one that you can read more than once yeah but i found a lot of books, some books you can read and pay attention with other noise. I got to be stone quiet because it's just, it's, it's a thinker. Yes. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not a, not an easy read, no. but a essential read. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it's one that he, it's actually based on a radio uh, podcast kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It's, he didn't, I mean, he, he didn't actually write it. It's his words, mm-hmm. which is kind of fascinating too. Indeed. During the World War II era, I yep. believe, too. Right. Was it something that was broadcasted during that time frame? Mm-hmm. It's awesome. Mm-hmm. Interesting guy. Yeah. We got to wrap, guys, or else this is going to be a two-hour episode. <laughs> thanks for coming, Josh. Yeah, thanks for having us. This is fun. I enjoyed it. You're interesting. You're an interesting guy. <laughs> just, just to be blunt. Just having conversation. Just having conversation, man. Yeah. You know? That's what we thrive on. Yeah. So thanks for providing a little bit of that for us. And we got some raw milk experience. <laughs> got now. some raw milk. <laughs> Everyone should go get some raw milk. Right on. Good it's awesome. More of it now. Yeah. First time we'll come down. We'll chip on. <laughs> <laughs> He's Josh. He's Philip. He's Isaac. This is Unfiltered Podcast. Till next time. Adios.